I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk on newer evidences on alpha glucosidase inhibitors. The objectives of the studies are to know the epidemiology and how Indians are different, what are the guidelines, what is the relevance of alpha glucose inhibitors in our patients, what are the new evidences. Uh, you will be surprised to know them. You are all aware that there are about 65 million people are living with diabetes and about 53% of people are not are yet to be diagnosed. Indians develop diabetes below 30 years and below 60 years, 50% of the patients die due to vascular causes. So we will have to address both these things. When somebody develops below 30 years, the complications are likely to occur at an earlier stage. If you look at the diagram, the post challenges uh, blood sugars are quoted as recents in studies from 1987 to 2004. I took three studies which uh, narrate all the points. Whenever you have isolated fasting glucose for fasting hyperglycemia or isolated post meal hyperglycemia, uh, this was as revealed by uh, in 99 by Pacific and Asian motion study and then IFG and IGT by the Fungata study and in Decoda study about diabetes. If you look at the left side, the CVD mortality in various hyperglycemic states and on the other side, all cause mortality are, are increased and are statistically significant with postprandial hyperglycemia. We all know in 2003, stop NADDM study was revealed and it revealed that type 2 diabetes could be prevented in 25% of patients, cardiovascular event by 49%, 91% by myocardial infarction and a new onset of hypertension by about 34%. At that time, we never knew what are the mechanisms behind it and Akarbos delays the progression by studies, it has been very well known, not only to delay, but reduce the risk of uh, cardiovascular events and prevent a new case of hypertension, particularly in patients with IGT. How this happens, some basics we'll have to look into. This is the vascular endothelium, uninterrupted. Now you can see, in all the three conditions, hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia, there is endothelial damage because of nitric oxide level is less. And there are inflammatory markers. Now when you choose your drug, it should reduce inflammatory markers and oxidative stress and reduce carotid intermediate medial thickness so that the endothelial damage could be addressed at the earliest time. Now if you look at why fasting blood sugar should be less than 100, people, uh, researchers have injected acetyl a choline into brachial artery and studied the dilatation pattern in normal and in diabetics, particularly with the IFG patients. In IFG, the dilatation is one third to that of a normal person. So try to keep the fasting blood sugar below 100. Next, we look into the postprandial effect. Two things you will have to look into. One is the metabolic effect. Next one is the vascular effect. In hyperglycemia, from normal 140 to 160, there is a vascular stress to the endothelial wall and you are all aware that the endothelial dysfunction occurs in pre-diabetes and the atherosclerosis later. So postprandial blood sugar should be kept below 140. And we all knew this slide. With each meal, there is hyperglycemia and there is oxidative stress and there are so many things quoted. Now, are we doing six-point blood sugar? We are not testing the six-point blood sugars. And if somebody has got postprandial hyperglycemia, post-breakfast, that becomes the pre-lunch hyperglycemia, and that is added to the lunch, and that extends up to the uh, dinner, and then up to 4 a.m. We are, for about 18 hours, we are in a state of postprandial hyperglycemia. Only after 4 a.m., we reach so this slide tells us currently 
you will have to address postprandial blood sugar vigorously in all the patients. How this postprandial hyperglycemia causes damage, we'll see. One is HDL lipoprotein cat catabolism increase, removal of LDL is decreased, free fat is clearance decreased, and then on the <coughs> diabetes aspect, glucose autoxidation is increased, and early phase insulin secretion and resistance are uh, insulin secretion is decreased, resistance is increased, and then there are intracellular addition molecules, inflammatory markers, and the endothelial function is decreased, and vascular uh, coagulation is increased in postprandial state. So we should select a drug or multiple drugs so that everything is addressed. Now, if, uh, we all know that the uh, ticking clock hypothesis stated to us that in IGT itself, or even before, atherosclerosis occurs, macrovascular disease, the ticking clock starts before the onset of diagnosis of hyperglycemia and its complications. Now, we all know we eat three meals a day, and insulin is secreted with each meal. But we check only fasting and postprandial blood sugar at diagnosis every month or once in three months. But we take three meals a day, teach from the beginning with the each meal blood sugar rises to your clients. And how to do that? First day you do the fasting and post breakfast, next day pre lunch and post lunch, and pre dinner, post dinner within two to three days and maintain this blood sugar level between 100 to 140 at all the means. But my professor SCBM used to tell, we cannot live with 100 and our numbers, relax them by 10 to 15 percent, occasionally they may change. Now, how to incorporate this knowledge? All of you have 100 rupees note. Before each meal it should be 100, after each meal it should be 150 rupees. With each meal, you should show the Rupee notes to them and convince them. I think it's not coming out. Okay. Pre-meal fasting, uh, pre-meal and post-meal, and uh, all should be less than 150. And teach them how many days per week? Seven days per week. So HB1 should be less than 150. And in 2011, IDF recommendation stated that postprandial or post-challenge hyperglycemia say in evidence level one. And all the met, met, <coughs> pathological mechanisms, including endothelial dysfunction, decreased myocardial blood flow, occurs in people with postprandial hyperglycemia, and this is harmful, and we should address this from the beginning vigorously. How different we Indians are? Glycemic response is higher in Indians compared with Caucasians. And there is rapid transition from pre-diabetes to diabetic state. Our Indians secrete less insulin, particularly in the early phase. Indian diabetics develop complications at very high, and they are at high risk. Indians are, have considered, considerably have higher prevalence of premature uh, death or coronary vascular due to coronary arterial diseases or when compared to Europeans. All of you are aware about this slide. Monier slide, uh, which states that below 7.3, postprandial blood sugar is very high, and you, in Western fashion, the postprandial blood sugar comes down, contribution comes down as the HbA1c level increases, and the fasting blood sugar takes over after 8.5. But the study by Wenge et al. in Asian population told. I uh, informed us that postprandial blood sugar, though it is increased in the beginning, after 8.5, it becomes static. That means at a point of uh, more than 8 or 9 HbA1c, we would anticipate fasting should be high, but it is contributed in Indians and Asians to the tune of postprandial blood sugar constitutes about 80%. So postprandial blood sugar occurs at all levels in Indians, whatever be the HbA1c. And if you look into this slide, when you give only carb high carbohydrate diet, 180 to 128 milligram in the morning, there is post breakfast hyperglycemia and other things are normal. When you give a high carbohydrate in the afternoon, that blood sugar post lunch is high and other blood sugars are normal. Same applies to the uh, night hyperglycemia with a load at uh, 122 milligram. The other things become normal. This is the pattern in non-diabetes. 
what happens in indians this is studied by uh, a study called the starch study we consume ve very high carbohydrate in our diet to the tune of 60.41% wherever we live whether it is east or west or central or south similar findings are there that was all the all over the india people consume more than 64% the ppg is more in indians more than 180 mg in 63% of patients this is because there is inadequate glycemic control in our patients next if you look at the other factors contributing to postprandial hyperglycemia and the cardiovascular problems are look into glycemic index and glycemic load the glycemic load is the amount of carbohydrate present in the food in a particular quantity if high glycemic load high glycemic index you will have a high hb1c if it is low both are low you will get low a1c at various quantiles of uh, hb1c Re what is the relevance of alpha glucosidase inhibitor in indians we have more than 60% we are rich in carbohydrate when compared to westerners and our carbohydrate load determines the postprandial glucose there is need to address this there is need to mo diet modification does it work the agent which reduces the absorption of carbohydrate should be introduced and agi is primarily all the agi is primarily takes care of this postprandial hyperglycemia alpha glucosidase inhibitors if, if you see there are two studies in study 1 with a placebo control we have compared the in blood glucose level and insulin levels are less after 4 weeks of treatment or 12 weeks of treatment in study 2 there is decrease in blood glucose and serum insulin level and that and the cochrane analysis showed us that there will be about a 3 millimole reduction in postprandial blood sugar and also there is a reduction in insulin markedly if you control postprandial blood sugar so the insulin sparing effect of Alpha, -gluc alpha glucose it is inhibitors have to be thought of whatever drug we give we took into lo lo look into two aspects one is body weight other one is hypoglycemic event and alpha glucose in inhibitors uh, have reduced the weight and all there are no hypoglycemic effect ethnicity and regional data if you look acarbos was effective both in europeans and caucasians but here you see that there is a difference and that results in more than 1% of reduction in hb1c there is a small difference favors the southeast asian diet and people will consume south eastern diet when compared to western diet we have about 1.54% reduction in hb1c and that is statically uh, <coughs> important when compared to the western population and this study called gluco vip study in which indians by about 2000 indians out of 60 15000 people participated in the global study we have ppg reduction by 74.5 mg 74 mg hb1c by 1 mg 1% and fasting blood sugar to the tune of 38% 38 mg in about 90 to 95% of patients that is most important and there was a study global study in which 16000 patients were in included with the treat for treatment with acarbos including in india kalra kal sorry kalra and most of the patients were southeast asians or asians only when compared to europeans and this study showed there is a more than 1% reduction in hb1c and reduction in body weight were depend upon dependent upon initial weight if there is a higher the weight more reduction in weight of the patient with treated with acarbos what is the choice of indian diet diet for diabetics or indian diabetes after uh, acarbos either as monotherapy or as metformin along with metformin there is a maximum reduction in hb1c and that is brought out by combination of hb acarbos with metformin and there is reduction in fasting fasting as well as postprandial blood sugar as i alluded early there is significant reduction in both when combination with h a uh, metformin is take uh, is thought of there is another study called globe study that also informed us that there is reduction in fasting and postprandial blood sugar and higher the basal hb1c there is more reduction in hb1c in the beginning so 
Akar, alpha glucose is delivered at treatment of the Akar boost, favors all the three, fasting, PP, and HPO1C reduction in the beginning. It is not only that five-year observational study has shown us uh, whether it is Akar boost with sulfonylurea or metformin or a combination of drugs or with insulin, there is maximum reduction in HbA1c whenever there is a combination with acarbos. So in other words, acarbos is equivalent to sulfonylurea, metformin, other drugs we have. And the newer pleiotropic evidences uh, are there is cardiovascular benefit because of nitric oxide and nitric oxide synthesis and car carotid medial thickness is reduced, uh, decrease in lipid metabolism and there is a GLP-1 response which we will see now. After 24 weeks of um, alpha glucosidase uh, acarbose treatment, in 2013, there was an origin, original article the, in cardiology, ca cardiovascular diabetology which showed us about uh, increase in fasting as well as postprandial uh, GLP-1 level with acarbose. Plasma level are bo in both states, it is increased very significant. Apart from its uh, PP blood sugar lowering, and in patients in whom uh, allogliptin failed, acarbose was added later on, and we found that with acarbose and allogliptin, the plasma glucose decreased and the insulin level was much more uh, decreased, and GLP level was increased. That shows, even though the GLP, uh, GLP one uh, allogliptin is there. Acarbose enhances when it fails. And this is the most important of the studies with acarbose in all the subjects or persons with, who have GLP with uh, following acarbose or subject with increased GLP-1 after acarbose showed nitric oxide increase, nitric oxide synthase through which it acts and that resulted in carotid intimal medial thickness and hence, oh, alpha glucosidase will address uh, endothelial dysfunction. And the alpha glucose acarbose not only lowers fasting of hypertriglyceremia, it all through the uh, test it lowers even up to two hours when compared to nataglinate, it lowers triglyceride level and hence the lipid metabolism. Stop NADM people who studied that later on found why people did not had hypertension was because of abdominal obesity, systolic BP at baseline and diastolic BP at baseline and transition to diabetes mellitus and treatment with acarbose was associated with reduction in hypertension with, uh, which is statistically significant. And the early improvement in carotid plaque in persons with acute coronary syndrome, when they were treated for six months with acarbose, it uh, showed integrated backscatter analysis by which CM carotid medial thickness was reduced. And that is co collaborated by reduction, uh, reduction in CRP level. So acarbose rapidly improves carotid plaque as well as they reduces CRP level. And there is Maria study, a meta-analysis of risk improvement with uh, acarbose. A multinational study showed that clinical MI was reduced to the tune of 64% and any cardiovascular event by 35 percent. So interaction, intervention with acarbose can prevent cardiovascular events in IGT as well as in persons with diabetes. And now I compared the cardiovascular benefits of metformin as stated by the UK PDS, where diabetes related death, all cause mortality, any endpoint or myocardial infarction or stroke were less in people treated with any type of therapy. But this was achieved without our knowledge in. Uh, stop NIDDM, NIDDM trial with a 91% reduction in clinical MI, any cardiovascular event by 50% and new onset hypertension 35%. So the mechanism which we did not understand, now we are able to understand with the, uh, the newer ideas and stop NIDDM mirror study or evidence cited by idea to control post meal glucose and to reduce CV benefits use alpha-glucose inhibitors, and uh, I have shown the evidence with acarbose. 
an overview of international guidelines, whether it is IDF in 2013, where alpha glucosidase after metformin or for metformin. It is it's a first line drug. And then second line drug. And then along with insulin, alpha glucosidase in inverts, which were not thought of in 2005, with 5.4% reduction in HbA1c. Now we have come to more than 1% reduction with HbA1c. And then this American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, you can look at these circular ones, alpha glucosidase inhibitor as monotherapy, or as dual therapy, or as a triple therapy, without this red tax. That means without warning. alpha glucosidase inhibitor can be used as first-line, second-line, or, or third-line drug in diabetics. And China went ahead in 2000. 10 itself, they started alpha glucose inhibitor as the first line and the second line or third line. Here I would like to tell you, of all the alpha acarbos produced in the world, 75% are used in China. That means their meal is full of uh, carbohydrate only. So the key messages are, our diabetic patients consume high carbohydrates, they are younger, have higher glycemic response and at higher risk of diabetic complications and most of the patients have higher postprandial glucose level and we love to create an awareness to the practicing physicians to reduce postprandial blood sugar whether it is IGT or diabetes so that we can reduce the CV risk. I have shown, uh, shown you the evidences for acarbos which is associated with beneficial effects on hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia body weight, and then GLP-1 enhancer. Here I would like to tell you, there is a new latest study in 2014, which was done in China. When you take an alpha glucosid inhibitor with a meal, the first 15 minutes, there is an increase in GLP-1 because some glucose can enter into the lower part of the ileum. But the, all the food that has to be digested later only, after one and a half to two hours only, they will reach the jejunum and then start stimulating the L cells so that GLP-1 will be enhanced. And this GLP-1 enhancement not only lasts up to two hours, it has been recorded up to 300 minutes GLP-1 level could be enhanced when compared to the comparator drugs or placebo. This only means whether alpha glucose is for acarbos can control fasting blood sugar. Yes, it, if you give night for six hours it can act. Uh, because of the late announcement of the GLP-1 uh, <coughs> uh, GLP uh, announcement after three to four hours, that may result in reduction in fasting blood sugar. Acarbos significantly blunts the postprandial hyperglycemic spikes and provides long-term glycemic control if used thrice daily with each meal. Comprehensive cardiovascular risk reduction must be a major focus of therapy, not the blood sugar. You see, you tell them, with the blood sugar, you will reduce your cardiovascular risk. So if you bring out your children nicely, you will have a good future for them. So like that, you will have to say, do the blood sugar. That's why I call diabetes as a blood vessel sugar disease. Please note, blood vessel sugar. People care only for sugar, not for the blood vessel. So that is my definition of diabetes. Diabetes is a blood vessel sugar disease. Care for the blood sugar as well as the blood vessel. AJ is like acarbos has long track record and efficacy with benefits like safety, weight reduction and negligible risk of hypoglycemia and cardiovascular protection in IGTs, diabetes and even isolated hyperglycemias. Hence, ladies and gentlemen, so far I have used the word acarbos because HB on reduction ranged from 0.77 to 1.3. There were more than 300 clinical trials. It, Acarbos is approved in more than 95 countries when compared to Oglebios only in six countries. Acarbos is approved by ADA, whereas this drug is, other drugs are not approved. Acarbos provided a comparable reduction in HbA1c and greater reduction in body weight when compared to Vildagleptin. Oglibos provides an inferior reduction, that's about 0.4% to 0.5%. Well-documented severe reduction I have shown to you in both in pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. There are 
few data are coming just now, but a long data is lacking. So, ladies and gentlemen, control, think that diabetes is a blood vessel sugar disease, control postprandial blood sugar, and give benefit, CV benefits to your patient. Thank you.